It's Friday, August 26th. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. The deadline is now extended for students in D.C. to get COVID vaccines. School leaders announced today that they have till January and explained why just days before school starts, they're delaying the shot that was mandated. We talked with some D.C. parents. I feel good. I feel like they are doing enough, at least for our family, to to make this an exciting transition back into school. And it's not just students who have new requirements to follow. With his ruling, a judge struck down a mayor's mandate that employees of the city, including teachers, must be vaccinated against COVID-19. We talked with the D.C. Police Union chairman who filed a lawsuit that tore down Mayor Bowser's executive order. This was an abusive process, and I think that the judge saw that, and he sided with the union and its members, and he's ruled that that policy has to end immediately. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. If your kids aren't in school yet, they're likely going to be there next week as big districts like Prince George's, Montgomery, and D.C. head back to the classroom on Monday. But in D.C., just days before school begins, vaccine requirements for students changed. In an afternoon briefing, D.C. school superintendent Dr. Christina Grant and Deputy Mayor for Education Paul Kine met with reporters to get the word out about a new deadline for kids. The background here is that last year, D.C. lawmakers passed legislation that required all students to be vaccinated 70 days after the FDA approved vaccines for their age group. So, of course, that meant different aged kids had different deadlines. Recognizing this is confusing for everyone, there's now just one deadline, January 3rd. D.C.'s infamous no shot, no school policy isn't completely off the table, though. Kind says enforcement will definitely take place and will begin with a note to parents whose kids don't have all the required vaccines. It's not 20 days from the start of school. It's 20 days from your official notice of noncompliance to families. And of course, you could send that out on the first day of school. But we uh, operationally, we thought that was a very bad idea because enrollment is still settling in schools. Not all schools know exactly who's officially enrolled. D.C. Superintendent Dr. Christina Grant says the reason behind the new timeline is to get all D.C. public and charter schools on the same page. So it's clear what is required of parents and students. It is something that we heard from our schools and our LEA leaders that they wanted a unified and aligned approach. This will again provide our schools with the time, the resources and efforts to make sure that we keep our classrooms healthy and safe. And so that is a broader framing for the why in the structure as we plan to effectuate and enforce this law. Despite the change in the vaccination rules, all D.C. students have to show a negative COVID test when they arrive at school on Monday. Luke spoke with parents at a Northwest school today to get their thoughts on the upcoming school year. So I'm just walking up to Lafayette Elementary School Park. The splash pad is splashing. The slides are full and kids are really getting their last summer look at this playground as school is about to start just in a few days on Monday. All DCPS schools are providing tests for parents and kids up till today. So we'll see what parents think about, you know, this upcoming school year and how they feel. Uh, My name is Kevin Loria. My name is Megan Clark. Just days before school is about to start, there are actually a couple tests that kids have to take before they even start school, one of which is a COVID test. How is that making you feel? Are you happy about that? Our son did COVID tests last year in pre-K, every weekend and it did help provide some reassurance that you know kids were healthy coming into school so we're okay with that especially coming off of a long break. Are there any concerns about going into school that it's going to be a safe environment? Do you feel it's going to be a safe environment? Um, I feel I feel comfortable. Um, I think we're still trying to decide if uh, how we feel about sending him in a mask every day or not. We still haven't made that decision, I think. Um, but we fe- I feel comfortable. I feel a lot more comfortable than I think I did last year. So, Right. And let's talk a little bit about the past two years. They've been kind of tough for kids and for parents. How was that and how much different is this year? I mean, I guess we'll see how different this year is. I think that the hope for everyone is that it's really different. Um, you know, Last year was our son's first year in the school system, and it 
really felt like they did the best that they could with what was a pretty tough situation. Um, you know, everybody's trying to figure this out as we go. So, you know, we were happy with the experience we had and we're hopeful that, you know, everybody can build on that knowledge this year. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's some excitement or some anticipations for a different sort of year this year. I think so. I, I think, um, I, I think that just with more information and more I ju it just seems like they're getting better. They're getting better working out some of these kinks, communicating, kind of getting feedback from teachers and parents and the community. And I, I just feel like we are, we're doing the best we can with what we know at the moment. And, um, and I feel really good about it. I feel good. I feel like they are doing enough, at least for our family, to, to make, to make this exciting, an exciting transition back into school, and and we are all for it. We're ready. And is there anything on the top of your minds that DCPS could do to make it better? I mean, I think that obviously keeping the communication up is really important. So especially as things change throughout the year, because you know there's the question, you know, what happens if there's a big COVID surge or something like that? Mm -hmm. And I think just kind of communicating about that and communicating about risk levels and kind of how they plan to respond, that's, that's really important. And so that's something that I really hope that we do see. We've got a, a lot of a lot of excitement, a little bit of nervous excitement, but we um, this is his first year at Lafayette. He was at a different school for pre-K last year, but we're, we're excited. We now shift our gaze from students who saw a change in their vaccine rules to teachers and school staff in DC who also saw a shift in their COVID vaccine rules. Actually, all DC government workers can no longer be punished for choosing not to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. That's according to a DC Superior Court judge who effectively threw out the vaccine mandate that applies that used to apply to all D.C. employees. Judge Maurice Ross ruled Thursday that D.C.'s mayor didn't have the legal authority to implement a mandate in the first place, saying Bowser's now, quote, permanently enjoined from implementing, imposing, and or enforcing the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Joining us now is Greg Pemberton, who is a union president for the uh, D.C. police here in town. And Greg is the one who filed on behalf of the union, filed a suit that argued, you know, police officers shouldn't be required to get this vaccine. Um, thanks for being here, Greg. We appreciate it. Thank you, Megan. Pleasure to be here. Tell us, I mean, first of all, it just seems like this has been going on for so long. When was, can you give us a little bit of background here? Like when was this suit filed and what has been the response from your members? Yeah, th this is an incredibly frustrating case because w what I think a lot of people forget is that in April of 2020, when the city and, and the whole country really shut down and went into full lockdown mode, our, our officers weren't subject to that. They didn't have the, the luxury of staying at home with their doors locked. Uh, they were coming to work and they were responding to calls and they were helping citizens and they were uh, going inside hospitals and going inside buildings, risking that. And, and uh, a large percentage of our membership did get sick and did contract the virus. And, and unfortunately, we even lost a few of our members to COVID during that time. Uh, then later in the year, uh, when the vaccine became available, uh, many of our members were quick to go get it. I think almost 90% of our members uh, went and got the vaccine and both doses and have now gotten boosters and multiple boosters. But there was a small percentage of our membership that did not want to get vaccinated and they had their own various personal reasons about that. And so we wanted to advocate both for the members that wanted to get vaccinated and also those that, that wanted to choose differently for whatever reason. And we sat down with uh, with the chief of police and the mayor's office, and we came up with a plan, which was that people who did not want to get vaccinated could submit to testing, weekly testing. And, and that program worked very well. Members went in, they got tested. They we The union felt like that was a very reasonable solution. Right. Uh, and then in December of 21, uh, the mayor just decided abruptly without discussing anything with the union uh, that she was going to eliminate that program and everyone had to get vaccinated within the next two months. Uh, so after we tried uh, diligently to try to speak with them and work it out, and there was really no movement on that issue, we went ahead and filed this lawsuit in February of 22. Um, and now it, about seven months later, the judges ruled on that case and he's come down in our favor. And what he ruled was that the mayor does not have the authority to issue a vaccine mandate and that the, generally the executive branch doesn't have this authority at all. And so she was exceeding her authority. She was exceeding her authority as a mayor. She was exceeding her authority under the emergency powers that she was granted. And at the end of the day, uh, this was an abusive process. And I think that the judge saw that and he sided with the union and its members 
and he's ruled that that policy has to end immediately. Now, this issue of COVID-19 and vaccine requirements is a hot topic. You know, oftentimes people think about it in a very binary way. It's like either anti-vax or pro-vax. But from what you just said, it sounds like it's a bit more nuanced. Can you talk more about that position exactly? Is it more so about just choice? Um, Could you talk about that more? Well, that's right. So as a union, you know, we have to advocate for what our members' wishes are regarding their working conditions. And this was something that involved their working conditions. It was a medicine that was required for them to do their job. Uh, and, and again, a small percentage of them approached us saying that they were uncomfortable. It could have been for medical reasons. It could have been for religious reasons. It may have been for other personal reasons that they came up with. But <clears throat> we felt obligated to try to develop a policy that encouraged our members to get the vaccine and allowed them to get it in, in, in a very rapid way, but also protected members uh, who chose not to. And what we wanted to do was make sure that those members who didn't want to get the vaccine were also being tested regularly so that there, there wasn't any, any um, calculated risk to their coworkers or, or to the citizens. And, and I think the, the plan that we had uh, effectively managed both of those things. And unfortunately, that just wasn't enough for the mayor. Uh, and she decided without discussion with us or without being able to bargain uh, that she was just going to do away with that policy that we had spent quite a bit of time uh, negotiating and agreeing to. Is it your understanding, Greg, that, um, and this is maybe just how I'm reading the order, but if it had been legislated, if it had gone through the city council, it would be legal. But the fact that it was a mayoral order under this emergency declaration, that it was really, that was where she overstepped her bounds? I think that's exactly what Judge Ross is saying, is that in order for this to be a legitimate lawful mandate, uh, it has to be a bill that is introduced by and passed by the city council and then approved by the mayor and, and subsequently by Congress, which all bills in D.C. have to be. Uh, and that that is in line with some of the cases he cited, particularly uh, Biden versus Missouri, the Supreme Court decision, which was that OSHA, under its executive authority, did not have the authority to issue that kind of a mandate. Uh, so so that it really goes in line with the Supreme Court decision saying that executive branches uh, of any legislative body or I'm sorry, of, of any government body uh, don't have that authority to issue this kind of mandate. There, there's other uh, protections that I think he uh, cited to the, the post board, which is the police officer standards and training board, which um, mandates health and medical requirements for both police and fire here in the city. That, that's the body in which would have to present this kind of evidence that this was a necessary uh, adjustment to their working conditions. And, and the, the post body was never consulted. This was just a unilateral decision by the mayor. And I think that the judge saw uh, that that was an abuse of authority and he agreed with our arguments and, and he's since eliminated the program. The mayor's office shared a statement after the judge's ruling that says in part, quote, over the past year and a half, we've seen that COVID-19 vaccines work. They keep people out of the hospital and save lives. We're grateful for all the residents and employees who stepped up and got vaccinated, whether they did so with no reservations or whether they did so nervously, but because they knew it was the right thing to do. Because of our collective effort, countless lives have been saved. And right when we cast our eyes to D.C. students, I just talked with a couple DCPS parents and I talked to them about the vaccine requirements for their kids, which is still in effect. And that made its way through D.C. Council. So it was a very different kind of way yeah. of ordering here, which is going to set up an interesting situation where D.C. teachers, D.C. employees aren't required, but D.C. students are. It's mm-hmm. kind of an interesting juxtaposition. I think, too, Greg, a lot of people wonder why wouldn't D.C. police want to be vaccinated because they're dealing with the public. Like, why wouldn't we want our police? But it isn't necessarily I mean, this maybe is to your point earlier. It's not necessarily whether it's safe. It's just the the way in which this was done. Uh, I think there, there's both issues, right, is that, that members don't like that the government is coming down, telling them exactly what they have to do and when they have to do it. Uh, but additionally, we have a large agency. We have about 3,400 union members, and many of them and their families went and got vaccinated very quickly. A lot of them reported injuries fr- from those vaccines. And when when they found, uh, when they had to deal with those injuries that their, their family members were going through after having been vaccinated, they said, I, I don't want to participate in this. I've seen my wife or my husband or my children go through something that it was absolutely uh, terrible, and I don't, I don't want to do that to myself. And I think that's a legitimate concern. Uh, I think only now is it coming to light that people are allowed to have conversations about this. But at the time, uh, you know, this was something that was taboo to talk about vaccine injuries. And and unfortunately, I think it's a reality and I think it's a discussion that people need to have. 
but there were members that came to us with empirical data about vaccine injuries of, of themselves and loved ones. And, um, you know, they, that, that was something that gave them the motivation to say, I'm not sure this is right for me. When you say vaccine injuries, you're meaning like a reaction to the vaccine, just so I'm clear. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, that they that members took the vaccine. Uh, we had one one member whose uh, wife took the vaccine. She was not a police officer. Uh, the member was, and uh, his wife immediately, within 12 hours, was admitted to the ER and went into a coma, um, and and was there for several days. And, and ultimately, wow. she recovered and she was well. But um, it, he then came to us and said, "I I can't put my family through this. We this is impossible for me to do." And he was ready to lose his job over it. Uh, so that those were the kind of stories that we were getting periodically with an agency this size, uh, unfortunately, that we were hearing about that quite a bit. And that was something that we wanted to protect members from. And so moving forward, you know, the Bowser administration has released a statement saying that they think the judge you know, misinterpreted their authority. Do you expect this ruling by the judge to hold? And or do you think the D.C. Council will step in and make this mandate official through other means? Uh, that all remains to be seen. It's very speculative. I, I don't know. This, this case is being handled by the attorney general's office. I, I, uh, you know, their interpretation of the judge's order, that's up to them. I think that the judge uh, fell in line with the Supreme Court decision, and I think it's a very powerful decision. And there's there's other arguments that are in there, which you know are hyper-technical. But if you look through it, you can see that that's not the only thing that, that caused him to rule on that. Uh, and I think this is a pretty obvious case of uh, abuse of authority by the executive branch. Um, the OAG certainly has the uh, right to appeal it if they wish, and then we'll, it'll have to be uh, decided by the D.C. Court of Appeals and, and see what happens from there. Uh, as far as the D.C. Council, uh, that, you know, again, remains to be seen. Uh, what you may notice in the judge's ruling is that he cites to two times in which the mayor went to the council in January and February of 2022 and asked them for the authority to continue with this mandate, and both times the city council did not address the issue. So it seems to be that there's not an appetite there from the council. I, I don't know if that has changed or this ruling will change their opinion on that. Uh, but again, I think we, we, sh we should find out uh, over the course of the next few weeks. Greg Pemberton, the FOP chairman for D.C. Police Union, thank you for your time. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention does say that the benefits of vaccination do outweigh the risks time and time again. Serious side effects that could cause a long-term health problem are extremely rare, though they do happen following any vaccination, including the COVID-19 vaccine. After the break, are you a fan of Roman history, Lord of the Rings, or Discworld? We learn about a live-action role-play group incorporating their storylines on a battlefield in Montgomery County. Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like this show, give us five stars and leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We love hearing from you guys and your reviews really do help other listeners find this, our area's only in-depth daily local news podcast. And thank you for making us a part of your day. Okay, before we go, this is what I want to start with. In a field behind a Montgomery County Public Schools office in Wheaton, Maryland, Several people dressed as knights, a Roman general, and characters from history and fiction were locked in fierce battle one recent sunny and pleasant Saturday. That lead to an awesome story by WTOP's Abigail Constantino, who is here now with me. And Abigail, this story, I, I, I can't even. There's, there's a cool video. Basically, tell me how you came upon this group and what we're talking about here. Okay. So um, I was at Starbucks in my neighborhood. <laughs> And I saw... <laughs> As the, every story begins. Well, there was this board where you post things, like I'm looking for a babysitter or whatever, right? Yeah. And I saw a tear sheet, and it said, come fight with us. It was two years ago, before the pandemic. Yeah. And I tore it, and I was like, I'm a, well, I don't know what this is. So I kept it in my bag for probably like six months. <laughs> and then I ran out of story ideas. And I was like, let me pull that out. And then I started researching it. The more I dug deeper, turns out it started in D.C. 
Okay, so what is it? Because I don't even think we've talked about what we're what the what the point of the story is. Okay, here. so it's called Dagger here, and it's a live action role play or a LARP, and you basically dress up as a character, usually like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings, okay. or you know, Harry Potter. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what a LARP is, and apparently, according to what I found, is that this is one of the earliest LARPs. And it started in the D.C. area in Rockville, Maryland. We don't have a lot of different types of characters that you can create. We have no magic involved in the game. There's no spells. There aren't, you know, so there's no wizards or, or warlocks or anything else like that. It's basically just based off of straight combat. So the athleticism tends to be a little bit higher. And you talked to the guy who started it, Steve Foster, right? No, he didn't start it. Okay. He's the uh, executive director of Dagger here. The guy who invented it, his name is Brian Weiss, and I think he lives in Arizona. <laughs> but um, Steve Foster, the executive director, said that he's not involved in Dagger Here anymore. He's okay, not in a long time. But so Dagger Here is a LARP. It's a LARP. Okay, yes. these are these are new words to me. Yes. Okay, and so you went out there. You went out to this field. Did you participate? Um. I participated in the before battle okay. and th- when they were testing the weapons. So before each battle, they have to test the weapons to make what sure. What weapons are we talking about? Um, they are like anything you could think of, like a, a knife, a, a sword, a joust, a jousting stick, or like an axe, but they are padded. Okay. And the padding that you use is similar to what you would find in a sleeping pad. Okay. Okay. So they're basically wrapping them in padding mm-hmm. so they don't actually really, really hurt each other. I mean, they hurt. <laughs> they hurt because I asked a dude, one of them, um, after he was hit like a million times <laughs> in testing um, this sword, Yeah, does it hurt? And he said, yes, it does. But it's not enough to injure. Okay. So, so they go out and they basically role play what? Things they come up with or different? Different themes. So okay. it could be like... It's kind of a free for all. So, like, you know, the factions, the units, they have like these different types of personas. So, one of them is Rome. So, there's this unit called Rome, and they're really into Rome and ancient Rome and Roman generals and Caesar and stuff like that. Cool. There's uh, one of them is called another one called the Guard, and they are into the books of Terry Pratchett, the Discworld series. The fantasy aspect of things and the medieval aspect of things have hit mainstream media really well. Like movies like The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit really did a lot. Game of Thrones really did a lot for the popularity of the sport. And then there's these other guys. Um, they're called Just the Guys. <laughs> and um, they're, I think from what I can tell, they're just really into the fighting. And so the battle um, is like, it could be like a scene from a book. And they're recreating it. Or it could be like, um, we're going to battle each other or we're going to battle this terrain. We're going to use this terrain as okay. a battle. So there's no, it's a free-for-all kind I'm of. I'm sure you've heard this. But this reminds me of that movie, Grown Ups, with Paul Rudd, where one of the characters was really into this, into the LARP situation. Yes. But that was the first time I'd seen anything about it. But this has been going on for decades. Since 1977. Yes. That's crazy. Yeah. And how many people were out there? I mean, they're all like dressed up too. They're all in. There were probably costume. Yeah, there were probably. I would say about fifty. And, and so, isn't it expensive? I mean, like, it could be expensive. So a lot of people actually have made their made a business about uh, of this because you know, hey, I don't know how to tan leather, right? <laughs> but I have to wear something. Oh, by the way, so the. The things you can't wear, like you can't wear sneakers, you can't wear an Under Armour shirt. So it has to be, oh. it has to be sort of like period, essentially. period a little bit. Or, huh. Yes. So anyway, so yeah. it it does get expensive, but you can make some of them yourself. So um, if you want to make a sword, you can make it your sword. You can buy one. If you want to make the clothing, you could make the clothing. You could, you know. Was it clear to you, like, okay, this is a Game of Thrones? idea or this is like the Romans thing or was it sort of a mismatch of it's, all different it's themes it's wonderfully really? anachronistic <laughs> so it, it's anything it's kind of like going to a to a a, a renaissance fair okay and it's just like anything goes so. I kind of love it yeah and you and you like took part a little bit like you you got the what'd you what'd you use a sword I, I used a sword and <laughs> they told me to hit 
one of the people who was, who was the test, or, you know, the one being tested if it's going to hurt. And so I hit him once and it was like harder. And I was like, okay. And then it was like as hard as you can. And I was like, and I did. And and then he walked away because it, it didn't it didn't injure him, you know. And then he walked away crying. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> Abigail Constantino, you have to check out this story. She's got videos and stuff. It's very cool. And if you're into it, we'd love to see more pictures. And, and I don't know. I'm just kind of like, I want to know more about this. So thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thanks, Megan. And that'll do it for us on the DMV Download. Thanks for joining us. We're sponsored by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab. And our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. And while you're at it, hit smash, push that subscribe button so you never (laughs) miss a show. You can also follow us on social media where we post content every day from behind the scenes. You can find out more about this podcast and become one of our VIP listeners at dmvdownload.com. I always do this part. The DMV Download is a product of WTOP (laughs) News. Listen on 103.5 FM in the D.C. area, 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, Maryland, online at WTOP.com and on the WTOP News app. Have a good weekend.